Okay, so there was one thing which had been left open, namely we ha I had said and we had proven, so kind of uh, bridging the gaps, remember that if E is a rank R vector bundle on a scheme X, uh, and we consider Pi the projection, we had proven that, sorry, uh, plus more, thank you. We proved that uh, the pullback map from, sir, from A D of X to A D plus R of E is subjective. And uh, we would like to show, so what we want to do is we want to show it is injective. And therefore, it allows us to uh, bring back cycles from E to X. So eventually what we want to do is we want to intersect, uh, that's why it's called intersection theory, cycles on a larger scheme with cycles on a closed subscheme. And basically our strategy would be to go the, do this in two steps. First, uh, do it for uh, the case where the closed subscheme is the zero section of a vector bundle, and then by reducing any other case to this one. So this is a very important one, so we have to understand it well. And uh, this requires, surprisingly, a substantial detour, which in turn leads uh, to introducing imp other important concepts. So let me also review some things which we had already seen, namely that if uh, x is uh, if x is a d-dimensional variety. There is a natural uh, group homomorphism from the Picard group of X to AD minus 1 of X, uh, which uh, we, uh, because Picard group of X, after all, is the Cartier divisors of X modulo rational equivalence. And of course, every Cartier divisor is in particular a divisor. So, and the rational equivalence here is the same as the rational equivalence there, because it's given by divisors that are the zero, uh, the divisor associated to a rational function. So, well, let me start by viewing Oh, this is really bad choke. Okay. Uh, what did I do? Okay. So let me try a new one. But I also have to just learn to press. What? This old. Okay. So the first thing we will do is to take this remark and uh, make it into a definition. Definition, let x be a scheme, L a line bundle on x, and uh, we write A star, as usual, as the direct sum of the Chow groups. We define the first churn class of X of L uh, to be an endomorphism of degree minus one in A star of X. So, uh, and I have to tell you how. So, I have to tell you how C1 of L 
maps an element in a d of x to an element in a d minus 1 of x for any d, well at least 1. For d equals 0, this is uh, defined to be, uh, this is 0, so there's nothing. So the way I do it is uh, I take a v uh, in x, a d-dimensional variety, sub-variety, and I uh, ob uh, consider the line bundle L restricting to v. So this is an element in peak v, and therefore it defines by this argument gives me an element in C1 of L. I define C1 of L cap V or times V. I mean, you, I never can remember which uh, a symbol you use here, but I just want to say it's a it's a map to be the uh, if you want the if you call this map div, then this is just a div of um, L restricted to V. So notice that this even though you have uh, uh, yes, thank you. Where I, V, is the inclusion. So, and uh, the first, and of course, uh, there is a small argument to do here, which is to check that uh, uh, this, uh, to, to show this, uh, this way I define a map from ZD of X to AD minus 1 of X, and uh, it requires a a small argument, which I will omit, to show uh, that uh, this uh, induces that this respects rational equivalence. Oh. Which ca is it a cap? Because my, pro my my other problem is I can't pronounce them right, and so I get confused. Is it the one I up or the one below? The one which is uh, con uh, like that. Cap. cap. So this one. Yeah. yeah, this is the one I seem to remember. Sometimes it's also written here. I don't think it's ever. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so that's uh, the other part. So the, if you know the book, you will see that uh, this, uh, uh, what looks like this very simple definition gets a very, very long story. So you can ask yourself uh, why it is there. And the answer is that uh, Fulton is working for the rest of the book. So he's preparing the material that he will need later. And uh, basically, a lot of his intersection work will reduce to the case of divisors. So let me make a remark about this, that uh, if uh, you, um, you are, uh, if you have a specific rational section of this line bundle, then of course uh, you can uh, take the divisor to be supported on the locus where the section is either not defined or zero. This uh, seems uh, clear enough. And uh, this is a refined version. So the fact that uh, the uh, Chow class, you are the, this class here, the fact here we have wasted some information by pushing forward. But for specific results later in the book, you may need the more refined version. And this makes, however, the first reading to the book quite, uh, I mean, quite a lot of work because there is an extreme hair splitting going on as to which uh, classes are defined on which closed subscheme. And if all you want is go beeline from, definition, from the first definition to intersection theory, 
you do not really need to do all that. It is just something that he is building everything in a logical order with the aim of proving everything he wants to prove. Okay, so this is just uh, in some sense something very simple and uh, the first thing he does after he has this definition is to prove that it is compatible with everything else he has done so far. So proposition, uh, the first churn class of line bundles. commute with proper push forward flat pull back and among them and each other so again this is the kind of the statement that I want you to remember. So that, uh, for that this is a standard strategy in the book of intersection theory that one of the important facts is that as soon you define something, you go and check that it is compatible with everything else you have done so far or if it is not, uh, you say okay, here you have to be careful, it is compatible up to this point, but what uh, this other thing you may hope is true is not. So, this is, so what, uh, let me explain what this means, i.e., well, uh, the each other part is very simple. So, let me write 1, 2, and 3. So, for 3, it is very simple, just means that uh, given L1 and L2 in peak X, uh, then uh, for uh, C1 of L1 cup C1 of L2 cup alpha is equal to C1 of L2 cap C1 of L1 cap alpha for each uh, alpha in AD of X. And this is actually not very difficult. So, you just, uh, I mean, it is actually proving this in detail is one of the points where all these pseudo divisor issues uh, play a role. But the main point is uh, remember, you may view this as a generalization of the usual first churn class that you know. The usual first churn class is an element in the H upper 2. And this, uh, if you are working over the complex numbers, uh, this AD map into the uh, homology of dimension 2D because uh, the homology dimension you make over the real numbers. So this is really kind of a, a in some sense, a generalization, in some sense, a specialization because you only compute it over algebraic cycles. And uh, however, it has advantage, it's very simple. So this is, again, a rather... I mean, there is an argument to be done here. It's not too long. Let me write what is uh, the context uh, for one and two. Uh, let us consider. Well, let me start for one. Um, let f from x tweedle to x be proper and l a line bundle on X and uh, alpha in AD of X tweedle. So the point is I ca the classes go, I have to, the line bundle I always have to put on the target because line bundles pull back. While here the homo the chow class I want to put on X tilde because I'm taking proper push forward. And then the statement is that uh, C1 of pullback of L intersected with alpha and then pushed forward is equal to uh, C1 of L intersected with the push forward of alpha 
in AD minus 1 of x. Again, this is not particularly difficult to prove. You just uh, have to prove something. Uh, you take this definition. Remember, the way you get this divisor is you take a rational function, um, a rational section of your line bundle, and you look at zeros and poles. And uh, here, what you do is your alpha corresponds to a, a variety. So uh, is the, uh, you may assume that it comes from the, as the class of a variety. So you take its image. So you have uh, the you take the line bundle restricted to the image, and you take a rational section. And since by definition of image, uh, the rational section pulls back to a rational section here. And therefore, uh, you can just uh, compute uh, that uh, the various multiplicities behave appropriately. So the divisors which are in the game are the same. And uh, you ha need some algebra to verify that the multiplicities are also the same. But it's not uh, particularly deep. It's more this is sometimes called the variation This is sometimes called, there, well, uh, this is one of the things which are called projection formula because we, we there are others but uh, uh, in particular this is the basis of all the projection formulas and um, finally for two we are in the same situation we take a flat map and and as this time we take everything on x And then one proves that if you can first apply C1 to alpha and then pull back, and this is equal to uh, C1 of the pullback of L applied to the pullback of alpha. And uh, here again, when I say flat in this contents, I always mean with relative dimension r. So I'm always insisting I have a relative dimension. And again, this step here is actually very simple. <coughs> you take uh, v, uh, the uh, irreducible variety corresponding to alpha. You take your rational pullback. The pullback will have irreducible components, which are varieties of dimension d plus r. And uh, the rational function, you, uh, the rational section of L you had on V will pull back to a rational section on each of these varieties. And then again, all you have to do is verify that the multiplicities behave properly. And in this case, this is actually not so difficult because multiplicities work well for flat maps. So this, this part here, it's a, it's a key important part. And it takes basically a whole chapter of the book to work it out properly and work out all the other properties uh, and the refined version of the first journey class. <laughs> so well, I remember, yes? Say it again. Uh, uh, I think yes. <coughs> I think when usually when you want, so you see, my problem is that when I work with stacks, usually you sh are supposed to use the, the uh, flat FPPF or FPQC topology. But uh, there is a nice theorem of Artin that tells you that if you have charts which are flat, then you can also find charts which are smooth. So I, in fact, uh, that, that is something, OK, let me uh, say we answer this next week. But uh, uh, the trick is uh, that uh, uh, flat morphisms uh, work well for many things, but not for all. And in particular, in the intersection theory, some parts require this uh, fixed dimension. <coughs> and uh, some parts, uh, like uh, the LCI part, you really can't do with flat. You have to put smooth. So uh, it is important. Somehow, while uh, uh, in some sense 
it all smooth and flat with uh, the various letters behind are all nice topologies, nice Grothendieck topologies, and in many ways they all have their descent. Uh, for intersection theory, they are not all created equal, so they play different roles. And it is comforting that uh, Artin uh, worked on this and uh, got out uh, as out of the hot water. Okay, so we seem to not really be moving uh, very much in this direction. Uh, so how did, and uh, the point is we have to take yet a bit more detour. So the point is that when you have, uh, in some sense, what I really would like is I would like to go back to X in some way after all. And uh, however, I can't push forward because he is not proper. So the idea is, well, there is a nice way to, if, uh, so then uh, the next step is you take, again, your E, a rank R vector bundle over X. And you consider P of E, the corresponding projective bundle. So what I mean here is I'm assuming that uh, E is a spec sim E and uh, P of E is proj sim E. So geometrically I'm taking uh, the space of one dimensional subspaces, not of one dimensional quotients. And uh, here what Fulton does, he says, well, certainly, so one is a good thing here is that uh, there is a natural line bundle here, which is, uh, so on uh, P of E, uh, there is a natural line bundle, which is uh, O of 1. I should write O P of E, but I think it's more readable since there will, this will be the only one I have. It's uh, O of 1. And uh, what you do is a definition. You define for all E, I uh, bigger and equal than minus E plus 1. R, R plus 1, thank you. Uh, because, of course, there's an E in my head because that's a notation. But I like the ranks to be R because I'm traditional like that. Uh, we define S i of E, and this will be an endomorphism of degree uh, minus i of A star x <coughs> by saying that S i of E, and again I would just say of alpha, but uh, the standard notation is this one, is given as follows. So let me give a, a, a name to this map, and I would like to call it uh, F, because I want to keep the pi for the vector bundle. So this is uh, F push forward of C1 of O of 1 to the E uh, R <laughs> minus 1 plus I cap F pullback of alpha. So the point here I'm using is that F is both proper and flat. So the, I can use it to go, bo go both ways. So I anyway, so I have, let me, however, uh, so yeah, yeah. So the point is, I'm taking the, the, the I think, I think that a full
So the point is the degree it, uh, it depends how you compute. So eventually this object here will be called a i. The, the will be an element here with it because uh, the question is as usual which indices you use whether you use a homology or cohomology uh, so co dimension or codimension. If you grade chow by codimension then this has positive degree as it should be because it's cohomology class. But as a home degree I mean as you know if you apply. I, well, I'll, 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 okay. The can, uh, then uh, this I can solve in a moment. Well, the point is this is well defined because uh, it's r minus one plus i. So this is a non-negative number. So this makes sense. But you can ask yourself, of course, why this is a strange indexing and uh, so on. And of course, uh, the first. So the first thing we want to agree is that this is well defined. Okay. So this is uh, means uh, so and so many time applying the mo the. And no morphism, and this is flat pull back, and this is flat uh, proper push forwards. So this is well defined. And the first thing you prove, lemma, is that Si of E is uh, 0 if I is negative, and S0 of E is the identity. So the indexings are chosen. So that uh, uh, anyway, these do don't play a role. So in part, uh, the index is chosen so that uh, it matches the degree, and in part, anyway, nothing here is happening. And uh, these SIs also have a name, and they are called Segre classes. So how do you prove these results? Uh, basically, so idea of proof. Uh, the idea is actually very simple because you see, if you let me be informal about it. Uh, let me uh, you basically what happens is by the usual by in Ethereum induction. you reduce to the case where the bundle is trivial. Sorry? Well, yeah, but you know, <laughs> it's, uh, the point it depends how you're lazy you are. Uh, so as I need it anyway, I may say it's immediately. But of course, the first part doesn't even need that. So the point is that at each step, you are cutting kind of with a, uh, with a hyperplane now. That uh, in this case, uh, you know what uh, if uh, E is trivial and hence P of E is uh, P n minus 1 uh, times P r minus 1 times x, uh, then what happens is that if you have a class v in, if you have a v sub variety of p of e, and remember, so you are pulling back. So you start with a v inside x, a sub variety. So f pullback of v is pr minus 1 times v. And now what happens is uh, if you take uh, uh, C1 of O1 in this case, uh, where the O1 is the O1 on these factors, what you get is that C1 of O1 applied to PR minus 1 times V, well, that it, it just comes from here. So this is just uh, PR minus 2 cross V. And so if you apply it, too few times, uh, what you get is you get uh, some projective space times v, and when you push forward, you get 0. And uh, when you take it exactly the right number of times, r minus 1 times 
PR minus 1 times V. Well, this is really the class of uh, kind of one point. I mean, a priori, I don't uh, know which hyperplane I'm taking, but I can every time just take the first or take the last. Just any choice will do. I know they are all equivalent. And so what happens is that this will be just isomorphic. Will be just one point times V for some choice. I don't know which one, because the first turn class is only defined as an element in the Chow group is not uh, defined as a cycle, but for some p in pr minus 1. And uh, so what happens here uh, of you know, a k valued point, where the k is the original one. And uh, so what happens is when I push this forward, I get back v. And it's f push forward. So this is kind of uh, the, the easiest uh, thing you can figure out. And uh, then what you do is you prove the same things, uh, the same properties uh, of compatibility that uh, you had uh, for uh, churn classes. So you prove the yes. Okay, let, let me just uh, uh, write this down more explicitly. So let me start with a remark that uh, if I work uh, with a P, uh, just so that I don't get mixed up with the indices, uh, that I work uh, with P and K and L is O of 1, then I can choose, uh, uh, I mean, if I take C1 of L and I apply it to all of V, for instance, uh, uh, this is equal to the class of HI for every, where HI is given by the ith coordinate equals 0 for all i equals 0 to n. So I can find uh, a rational section, in fact a regular section of O of 1, which uh, vanishes simply over hi, because xi is a section of O of 1. So this is a regular section, there's no pole, and there is one 0, and it's a simple 0. So now I want, and of course, uh, if I pull back, I pull back. So now if I take uh, P and K times V, uh, I can apply the same argument, and I have, sorry, C1 uh, L. And here L, I mean, uh, L is the P1 pullback. So the projection on this factor, pullback of O of 1, this is also can be viewed as HI times V. So for instance, I can take the last one. I can take HN cross V. But now this HN is just a PN minus 1. And I keep doing this again and again and again. And when I have done it n times, so if I do it n minus 1 times, I'm just left with a p1. And when I do it n times, I'm left with a p0. And p0 is just spec k. So this is just, uh, if you want, if you want to view this as uh, this is uh, if I choose, so at the, if I want to have a cycle and not just a cycle class, I, what I do is at each step I first choose Hn, then Hn minus 1, and so on. 
and when I do it n times, what I get is the class of P0 times V, where P0 is this point here. 1000. Zero, zero, zero. Every time I have taken, I have done always the same formula by always uh, um, putting to 0 the last coordinate. Yes? I am sorry, could I, I, there is a very noisy uh, sound here. Yes. Yes. So here, here I, I, yes. Right. So let me root n minus 1 times, you are reduced to p1 cross 1. Yes. So what I only doubt is in the last step, you just have spec k. So you have no line bundle here to put it back. No, no, no. I have p1 and then I do the intersection with a line bundle there. The, the, I am left with a point only at uh, the last, uh, at the last okay. step. So you, you have that, uh, that you, you start with, uh, let me now use these indices. You have PR minus 1 with the first C1, you go to PR minus 2, and so on. And then uh, with the uh, R minus 1. OK, so and uh, what you prove now, uh, before I say this, uh, see, we will not uh, need it so much. But uh, still, for completeness, and since we are talking about uh, this, this stuff, uh, let me remark that, uh, in particular, you see now, since we are there, so remark, um, if you look at it as at A star of x, uh, as a graded module, a Z module, it is complete. It is complete for the obvious reason that uh, it uh, has no higher degree, uh, I mean, it, it's zero in high enough degree, in degree above the uh, dimension of x. Now, if you have a, a complete module and uh, you have a family of endomorphisms uh, such that uh, the S0 is invertible, in particular in this case S0 is the identity and uh, all the others are in positive degrees, what you can do is you can define the total churn class S of E, uh, the total segre class. total segre class to be defined as uh, the sum and a priori this is an infinite sum but uh, remember that uh, this is uh, complete uh, for stupid reasons in fact uh, you can uh, stop at sn of E uh, for n equal the dimension of x, because all the others are 0 for trivial reasons. And uh, what is uh, obvious from the completeness is that uh, this and the fact that as Sorry, sorry, uh, complete uh, in the graded topology. So if you, it's, it's complete in the trivial, it's finite, but uh, the point is uh, that when I was uh, uh, very, very young and way before I saw a Chow group or even a homology group, somebody was telling me about power series. And I was told if you have a power series and the starting coefficient is invertible, uh, then you can invert the power series. And this made me feel very, very intelligent because I could actually prove it. So I always say it again because it cheers me up. So the, the key point here uh, is the, the fact that it's complete. It, what I want to say is that in principle it could work even for things which are very large, uh, uh, w which you don't have, is so long as you keep everything uh, complete. I mean, this, uh, anyway, so let me, and therefore, 
one can find an inverse. It has a unique inverse C of E, which I mean, uh, of course, it has its graded parts. Except a priori, this goes again until n, and uh, then there is a nice uh, result, which I definitely will not prove, also because we will not need it. Uh, but it's a very important result, and if you haven't seen it, proposition uh, C i of E is 0 for all i larger than the rank of E. This is not true for the Sager classes and of course, this uh, C i of E is called the i churn class. of E. And uh, note uh, for obvious reason this is not true for the Segre classes. I mean you just write it for the churn classes, take the inverse and you check that in general you do not get 0. So, this is uh, and uh, the proposition is that uh, Segre classes and churn classes of vector bundles commute with proper push forward, flat pull back and each other. There are many ways to prove this. One of my favorites, uh, so idea of proof of this. is that you can reduce to, um, to uh, the case of the line bundles and the first churn class by using the so called splitting principle. So, oh, there is one thing sorry which I did not say, so let me say it here uh, lemma uh, or remark that if L is a line bundle the two definitions of C 1 of L agree. I mean, this is uh, kind of uh, obvious, but uh, you, you know, you want to check that uh, you uh, actually have uh, have done that. Okay. So once uh, we have this, uh, so that uh, the C i is uh, the C one of a line bundle is actually the C one we had defined previously. So once I have this uh, to prove this one. And in general, to prove properties of churn classes and Segre classes, a useful uh, technique is the so called uh, splitting principle. Yes? Ah. It's the so called splitting principle. And the splitting principle is something about the fact that when uh, it comes into two parts, the part one is that if uh, E is a sum of line bundles, then uh, the C i of E is the ith symmetric function of uh, the C ones of L one. L R. Note, it, note that by the way the definition is given, the Segre classes determine the churn classes, but also conversely. So as soon as you can prove something, which means in particular that also the Segre classes can be defined in terms of uh, the uh, churn classes of the line bundle. And two, and uh, this is actually not particularly difficult. 
So, this is something which is uh, in fact uh, nice and pleasant to prove. And uh, the part 2, which is also nice and pleasant and geometric, is uh, you can uh, always assume that. It is also true if you have a filtration. And uh, again, there are uh, you can prove it directly, or you can prove it by degeneration and uh, by saying that you know it's uh, on the general point it's one and on the special point it's another, and then uh, it has to be the same because it's a rational equivalence. So it, uh, there there are many ways, but uh, the point is I, I find uh, for some reason I find direct sum very comforting because I. I and you can always assume that uh, by doing an appropriate base change. So, uh, and here, uh, what this means, I think, uh, would require a somewhat larger detour. So, if you know it, uh, it, it is nice that you know it. If you don't know it, again, I suggest you check the part. So, if uh, so, what is in the chapter of uh, chapter 3 is where Fulton introduces uh, Segre classes and Chern classes. So, what you have there, uh, if you have to read something, my suggestion is read some version of the splitting principle and familiarize yourself with uh, the at least the names of all the other classes, like there is something called the Todd class which is defined there and you are looking at it and like what and then of course it comes back and haunts you when you do Grote and Dick Riemann Roch. But um, that is really uh, un, uh, I mean a uh, uh, kind of uh, so you should just know the names so that when you find the names in the literature you know I do not have to worry they are all written there in a very clear way. There is no point learning them all by heart before you have to use them in my personal opinion. And uh, this also is kind of a nice thing because if you want a theorem to be if uh, you are stuck somewhere without a book nowadays we all have uh, internet access uh, so this does not happen. But in the good old times where the book was in the library or if you have a problem when you are home, uh, then uh, you can say, okay, let if I you do not remember the formula, you can check it with this trick. And uh, this way basically you reduce these properties to properties of first turn classes. So we are still nowhere near proving this. And uh, uh, we have already used quite some time, so let me just say one more step, which is that, so how do we prove this? And uh, the proof goes as follows, uh, what you prove is you prove two things at the same time. This follows from the following theorem or proposition. Uh, if you take f p e to x as before, then you have a natural map theta from a direct sum for i equals 0 to r minus 1 of a star of x to a star of P of E, which is given by theta of uh, A0 A R minus 1 to be the sum for I equals 0 to R minus 1 of uh, C1 of O1 to the E to the R minus 1 plus I. Uh, times um, f pullback, uh, sorry, to the i of uh, f pullback of alpha. Uh, let me check that I have the correct number. Yeah. And uh, the claim is uh, that this is an isomorphism of groups. 
And uh, the idea is that these two proofs uh, come together in the following way. So you use the surjectivity of the pullback here to prove the surjectivity of the theta by essentially splitting, uh, reducing to again to the trivial bundle. So the, the way you do is you reduce to uh, studying P of E plus OX, so the trivial bundle. This contains E, and the complement is P of E. And uh, you use this decomposition to show that the surjectivity of pi pullback implies the surjectivity of theta, because you reduce, uh, again, you use an Ethereum induction, bring the bundle to be trivial, and uh, you get the surjectivity. And, uh, then to prove that this is injective, uh, you assume that there is a relation and you use the vanishes of the negative uh, segre classes to prove that this is a contradiction. Okay, what's alpha? Sorry? What's alpha? It's alpha, uh, sorry, A, I, sorry, thank you so much. So you use uh, the so the uh, way the proof works is you use the surjectivity of pi pullback to prove the surjectivity of theta. And then you prove the injectivity of theta by using the vanishing of the Segre classes. So uh, you assume that there is such a relation. You take uh, the highest coefficient which doesn't, which doesn't vanish and you multiply by uh, a CI a corresponding C1 to the appropriate power, so that here you get exactly R minus 1. And uh, you use that uh, negative segregate classes vanish and the zero segregate classes the identity to get a contradiction. And then once you have the injectivity here, then you uh, go back here and you show that it's <coughs> injective again, because if it weren't, you would get a relationship. So. This is uh, kind of uh, where the argument goes and how you complete this proof. Yes? Okay, that uh, that uh, is po yes. Yeah. Well, it is equivalent. It is, of course, nicer yes, if uh, that uh, you prove it degree by degree. That you there is always a direct sum on the left, on the right side, you could have a one degree. And that's easier to prove also. Yeah, well, I in the end, it yes. OK, yes, the, that's true. So you, what you do is uh, you uh, check it. You fix the degree here, and you take the inverse image here, which will be a sum of different degrees. OK, so now we are ready for our definition. So definition, let f from x to i be an LCI morphism of schemes with an explicit factorization x i in m, pi in y, where <laughs> here I assume that i is a regular closed embedding and pi is a smooth map. I also assume that, uh, uh, of, uh, that this is LCI, f LCI of relative dimension r and the pi smooth of relative dimension S. Then I define a map and sorry, one more piece of notation. Let Y twiddle in Y be a morphism and uh, uh, X twiddle the inverse image, let me call this 
g g minus 1 of x. This is a closed subscheme of sorry x treadle it is not g minus 1 it is the fiber product and this x treadle is a closed subscheme of uh, m treadle which is m <coughs> times y of y treadle which has a smooth map. So, this is smooth of relative dimension s and this is a closed embedding, but in general is no longer regular because if you pull back a regular embedding, it uh, can be regular of a different co-dimension, it can not be regular, it can do anything. So, and uh, let me call uh, g tweedle the morphism from x tweedle to x. And then I define a morphism f tweedle from z d of y tweedle to z d um, plus r of x tweedle uh, to a d plus r. Notice I start with cycles and I end with cycle classes as a composition of three morphisms. So, I take z d of y tweedle, I go to z d plus s of m tweedle, I go to z d plus s of the normal cone of x tweedle in m tweedle and finally, I go to a d of x tweedle. So, let me explain what these all are. Yes? So, this is 1, 2 and 3. Phi is the smooth of relative dimension S. Uh, see, here is d plus r, sorry, yes. Thank you. So, step one is just a, a flat pullback. Smooth, smooth implies flat, but basically by definition. And so, I it just take flat pull back. And uh, step two, step two is actually kind of, uh, it is the degeneration or what, this is what is called the specialization and the specialization goes as follows. So, you have a cycle here. So, you have V in M twiddle a d plus s dimensional sub variety and uh, what you do is uh, you associate to it the you you take w to be the fiber product of uh, the intersection the scheme theoretic intersection with x twiddle and you construct C W in V. Uh, this is a, a D purely D plus S dimensional co over W. And uh, now you use this uh, pullback property of uh, cones. So, remember you have this diagram W goes to V, X goes to M tweedle, X tweedle goes to M tweedle and X goes to M and these are all Cartesian. 
So, this tells you that uh, C w in V is contained in the pullback to w. So, the restriction this is uh, a closed embedding. Okay. So, this is a closed embedding. Let, let me do all the steps I have. This is an arbitrary map I do not know anything about, but this is a closed embedding because V is a sub variety. <coughs> this is a closed regular embedding. When I base change it, I do not know what, uh, whether it stays regular, but it is definitely closed. So, this is closed. Let me just write everything I do know. This is closed regular. This is closed. This is closed. Since it is Cartesian, this is closed. This is closed. So, I have the normal cone of w in v which is pure dimensional of the same dimension as v because v is a variety this is uh, something we saw yesterday it was part of the degeneration argument now we have seen uh, that uh, the cones behave uh, well let me also give some names remember this was f this was g and this is g twiddle and uh, what we have uh, is that uh, the cone of W in V, let me also give a name to this map, let me call it G bar. This cone is a clo has a closed embedding in G bar of uh, Cx twiddle in M twiddle, because this is a Cartesian diagram. But uh, you see, this G bar is a closed embedding. So this has a closed embedding inside C x tweedle in M tweedle. Because this is just, uh, this is a morphism over x tweedle. Is this is a cone over x tweedle, and this is just a restriction to W. So, this is a closed embedding, so this is also a closed embedding. And uh, finally, this has a closed embedding to G twiddle pullback. Okay, so this is, uh, this is all I have done. So, I can take this is pure dimensional, so it has a fundamental class of dimension D plus S because it is pure dimensional. And now, I have two closed embeddings. I just push it all, all the way forward. So, push forward via closed embeddings. If you want, it, this thing here is already a sub scheme here. So, you just can, just can take its fundamental its class here. Gives us a class in A D plus S of the cone of in Z D plus S of the cone of C Tweedle in M Tweedle. And now we are at notice that step one and step two are steps which happen on the cycle level. So I don't need rational equivalence yet. And now I come to rational equivalence. Step three. I have a C X twiddle M twiddle. Let me look at this map again. This is contained, it's a closed embedding into G twiddle pullback of C x in M. But by assumption, x in M is a regular embedding. By assumption, x in M is a regular embedding of codimension S minus r. And therefore, Cxm is equal to Nxm 
is a vector bundle of rank s minus r. And so, this map here is given by you take z d plus s of c x tweedle m tweedle, you push forward. Let me call E this vector bundle or C, does not matter, to Z D plus S of E. Of course, this maps to A D plus S of E and and uh, then you have a d plus s minus d plus s minus uh, s minus r, which is d plus r of x tweedle, which goes here by pullback. And by what we saw, this is an isomorphism. And if it's an isomorphism, I can go the opposite way. So, this defines for me, for any choice, if I take any LCI morphism together with an explicit factorization, it gives me this map F upper shriek. And uh, the lemma which completes the definition is that one uh, F upper shriek induces a homomorphism with the same notation f upper shriek from a d of y twiddle to a d plus r of x twiddle. So, it passes to a rational equivalence classes and two f twiddle does not depend on the factorization. So, how do we prove this? Let me discuss num number one. So, the fact that you pass to rational equivalence. So, at this step, we know that uh, we are fine with rational equivalence. Yes? Why is it why in this side? This is something new. In what sense, new? Uh, if y, y tilde is y. It, it's an important special case. Okay, so let me, before I answer this question, let me try and say that, in fact, the case where y tilde is y is the case you mostly have in mind. <coughs> However, it is important for later uses that, in fact, it isn't the only case. And uh, this will, it does play a big role. I mean, uh, uh, when I first read the book of Fulton, well, when I first read the book of Fulton, I didn't understand anything. But uh, when, uh, after a few years and with some help from a number of people, I finally read uh, some parts of the book of Fulton, I was kind of wondering, so why do we want all this hair splitting thing? Most of the time, we just want to go from y to x, not from y tweedle to x tweedle. But Fulton has a vision. <laughs> Fulton is a great mathematician. And uh, um, the point is, in some cases, it is uh, important that uh, you can do this pullback even if uh, the morphism x y tweedle to y tweedle itself does not come with such a factorization. So, there are a number of applications. So, first you, you do this and doing just the case where y tweedle is y uh, makes you extremely happy. It is enough to define intersection theory in the Chow group of a non-singular variety and uh, you feel that you are quite happy with it. But, once uh, uh, time passes and you want to do further computations, you realize that uh, this result is actually extremely important. In fact, this will be a key step in uh, what we want to do next week. For example, 
Yeah. So it's a, the point is, uh, as I said, Fulton is building for the future, and in this case, uh, so am I. <laughs> but uh, so it is a, a very important result. So let me try and uh, uh, let me finish saying this, and then I will make a few more comments. So first thing is, how do we prove it passes to rational equivalence? And uh, as you notice, there is no problem in this step, which is just a flat pullback. And there is also no problem here, because here we had uh, a push forward, a proper push forward, and then uh, we had this pullback, which is already on the Chow group level. So the only problem is uh, at uh, this step here. And in fact, in this step, there is a push forward, uh, which is not difficult. So what you have to prove is uh, that if you start with W, and you, uh, you assume uh, that you, you take here, instead of starting with a W, you take a linear combination of Wi's, which are the divisors of, uh, of uh, sorry, you start with your V. And uh, now you take a rational function on your V, takes the divisor, and then you do the normal cones and take the corresponding combinations, then you get something rationally. So that uh, this map, this specialization, which associates to V the class uh, CW of V, what you want to prove is it preserves rational equivalence. Remember, how is this CWV done? You take, so what you do is, uh, uh, th that is very simple. You take your, uh, your rational equivalence at this level and you push it at the cone level. So, it is something that you have to write down, but it's actually rather simple. So you just uh, use the same rational function, basically. There's nothing very much in it. You have to, again, use the degeneration to the normal cone. You take uh, the the degeneration, the you take your rational function, which defines a rational equivalence, and you extend it. So this is uh, the part which is, uh, so this, in particular, once you have this lemma, you get as corollary that uh, to any LCI morphism, any base change of an LCI morphism has a pullback. And this pullback is called I think it's called refined Giz in pullback in the case of a r regular embedding. And I, I mean, it's just called F upper shriek. <laughs> so let me make a few comments about what is important in this kind of result. So the, the first thing which is important is that Oh, and uh, I mean, I don't want to discuss this now, but once you have done all this work, the next thing Fulton does is he proves that these pull, uh, upper shrieks, they are compatible with proper push forward and flat pullback. They are compatible with churn classes, and they commute with each other. So it, it, which each of these statements requires setting up non-trivial diagram. So let me just uh, tell you something about the compatibility with the flat pullback and proper push forward. Oh, yes, sorry. I didn't tell you how about step two, that it doesn't depend on, uh, the, uh, on the factorization. So one is uh, uh, well defined on A star. This uh, you prove uh, by you essentially just uh, check uh, step two, so the specialization argument. This is the only non-trivial part. And uh, step two, which is the fact that it's well defined, uh, step two reduces to comparing exactly what we had uh, done. So. smooth and i j regular embedding 
And uh, what you do is you use exactly the exit sequences of cones we had uh, produced uh, to, ch to check that you get exactly the same result. So you have two different cones, but these two cones differ by a vector bundle. And uh, it turns out uh, that you have a few extra C1s to induce, and these C1s exactly get rid of that bundle. So nothing happens. So this is checked by working more or less abstractly with exit sequences of cones. And again, it is surprisingly easy. So you have set up all this machinery, but then all the pieces come together. And somehow my hope was that I would manage to have it all in one blackboard. Because that's, I think that's the part which is difficult. This definition is spread out the first six chapters and with a heavy use of the appendices as well. And I think for beginning, it's a good thing to once see the whole picture. So where do we want, so and then of course there are, so let me just uh, say a few more things. So what do I mean by compatibility with proper push forward and flat pullback? So assume you have uh, such a Cartesian diagram where this is LCI. And then, for instance, uh, what you can do is you can assume this is uh, flat, and you can check that then uh, the upper shriek here commutes with the upper shriek here uh, with uh, respect to flat pullback. Or you assume this is proper, and then you assume that uh, you prove that the upper shriek here commutes with the upper shriek here uh, with a push forward uh, with the upper shriek there, and so on. Uh, you prove that it commutes with churn in churn classes. You take a line bundle here, uh, a line bundle here. You uh, multiply with the churn first churn class and upper shriek, or first you upper shriek and then you multiply with the first churn class of the pullback bundle, and nothing changes. And finally, there is a very complicated special case where uh, uh, the commutativity with each other is uh, something which uh, has more or less this form, where here you have another LCI. And then what you have is that upper shrieking here induced by this, followed by upper shrieking here introduced by this, is the same as upper shrieking here first, and then upper shrieking here in the other direction. So this is, uh, so what you should get is that these things are really, really well behaved, except, and uh, with the factorizations as well, except that there is one trick. So the, the important uh, asymmetry is the following. If what Fulton proves is that uh, if you have that uh, F is a regular embedding and uh, G and G composed F are flat, uh, then notice that here it's flat, then uh, F upper shriek composed G pullback is equal to G composed F pullback. So that uh, in some sense you have two different pullbacks. There's a flat pullback and the regular embedding pullback. And uh, they are compatible nicely, so, so far so good. Uh, but then, on the other hand, if you assume, you, you make a little change, you say, OK, let me assume that uh, G is flat, and the composition is a regular embedding, and you don't have a theorem. You have to assume that it is smooth, and that F, that G composed F is a regular embedding. And then you get upper shriek here. But what you need uh, is you need that this is smooth and not just flat. So uh, it, well, if it's flat, it means every base change is also flat. You just call it G pullback. Or if you want, you can put a tweedle. But uh, it, it is uh, very simple because base change of no. 
No, it, it, uh, it just automatically induces. Uh, it's like the push forward induces push forwards. So the point is uh, w that uh, the push forward and the pull back, uh, flat pull back and proper push forward automatically induced map on every base change because base change of flat is flat and base change of proper is proper. And uh, the point is with LCI, it's not true anymore that the uh, base change of LCI is LCI. But uh, yeah, somehow the feeling is that you really want uh, an object which as uh, this language, I think, was introduced jointly by Fulton and McPherson, as far as one can understand reading the book. They have this notion of being bivariant, so that once you have a property of the morphism, this property will be inherited by every base change. So where can one go from here? There are several directions. For instance, a typical first thing you want to know is uh, what happens is when you make a diagram like this, uh, this is LCI and this is also LCI. Then you have two different two pullbacks here which are a priori different. And uh, this can be understood. For instance, they could be different degrees. And this is well understood and there is a formula which is called excess intersection formula. So this is the one typical thing you can do. And then there is a number of chapters where you explain uh, you know, how you use it and so on. What I would like to do instead next week is, uh, uh, first of all, address in some sense a very trivial question. What if you don't have such a global factorization? You know, can one do that something in that case? I mean, typically, in all cases I can think of, the factorization exists. But the, the main problem is that the one thing is that the factorization exists, and one thing is that you can prove it. So it is uh, sometimes very useful that you don't have to worry whether the factorization exists or not. It makes your life so much easier. And uh, indeed, uh, this is uh, possible, and uh, it uh, requires a kind of change of viewpoint. So this is where we will be going next. So this is uh, kind of a very compact presentation of the basics of classic classical intersection theory. And uh, next week, we will be covering more advanced material. And I can tell you already, we will be at least mentioning what an algebraic stack is. It will be done in a very informal way. If you want uh, to, if you have a very, uh, there are a number of references nowadays in the literature. There is a book in, Fra in French which has the problem that it's in French in several senses of this word. And uh, there's, uh, um, there's uh, the appendix of uh, Vistoli's paper in Inventiones 90, which is a very nice introduction for al to algebraic stacks. And uh, there is, uh, uh, well, I have written some notes which you can find. And there are some humongous notes that are being written on the internet uh, by a group uh, based around John de Jong uh, in uh, uh, Colombia. So, De Jong, but I, uh, I, yeah, I, um, I'm always confusing the De Jong and I can't pronounce, com pronounce any of them. Uh, so, uh, then uh, what you have is there are plenty of references. If you don't want to spend your week in reading references, I suggest you go either for the appendix of Vistoli or for the thing I wrote because they're very short. And uh, the other thing is that we will need a little bit of uh, derived categories. Again, we just need a basic idea. We need uh, that you know what is a complex and you know what is a quasi-isomorphism. So a morphism which commutes with cohomology. And we will only use complexes with two terms. So it is uh, the kind of the babyest baby case of derived category you can imagine. And uh, finally, there is one more language which I would like to introduce. I will say a little bit about it, which is deformation theory. The point is, there is the kind of this normal cone has another incarnation. And this incarnation, both of the normal cone and the normal sheaf, is related to deformation theory. This is not surprising because uh, as I said, it's something that works well locally in the smooth topology. And being smooth for a morphism of finite type of, of, of finite type of schemes of finite type over a field 
is something which can be checked on the formal level. So, my viewpoint is uh, there are two kinds of theorem properties about schemes, morphism of schemes. There are the topological properties like proper and separated and uh, there is the evaluative criterion that uh, if you are a, a geometer, a classical geometer like me who does not know what discrete valuation ring is that uh, you just need uh, to test what happens on smooth curves. So, in particular, you can forget the whole scheme structure. You, it, the property would not change if you pass to reduce sub scheme. All that counts is the stupid topology. The other approach is there are some properties which really only are algebraic in nature, and for instance, so are being smooth and being et al. And uh, what is the most algebraic thing that you can do to a scheme? is you throw away completely the topology, you assume that it is only one point and you work with fat points. So, schemes uh, that have only one point, you have gotten rid of the topology completely and the formal criteria for etalness and smoothness tell you that to test etal and then smooth, it is enough you understand what is going on with those. So, in some sense you have a, a you know divide and conquer approach to algebraic geometry. Some things are purely topology and you test them with smooth curves and some things are purely algebra and you test them with fat points because the fat point will not have any topology. The topology is gone, you only have a ring and uh, this is what we will do. We will, uh, we have seen uh, this uh, global construction of the cone and we will see that it has a geometrical interpretation in terms of the formation theory. Okay, now I'm done. Thank you. I have a